summary statement, God is at work advancing his purposes in the midst of complexity, in the midst of extraordinary complexity. Um, He's advancing his work. Coralie and, and, and Chris referenced this idea that in a, in a place that's 98% Hindu and 2% Muslim, did I get that? Buddhist and 2% Muslim, um, uh, where, where, where human rights uh, are, are being horrifically violated, certainly in some places, um, uh, God is doing extraordinary work of bringing women to faith in himself. God is at work in, in the midst of extraordinary complexity. Um, and, and I'm gonna call you to, to look at the complexities of your life, and I'm gonna ask you, will you trust him in the middle of whatever those complexities are, whatever those unknowings are, will you, will you walk by faith rather than by sight? Will you? God's advancing his work, um, and, and maybe some of you have been like me, and you said, I, I wish life were simpler. And... And we'd high five one another and say yes, and then say, and now what do we do? Because life isn't anywhere near as simple as we wish that it were. I'm fascinated by the game of chess, and when I start referencing this, I am not challenging anyone to a game because I'm a terrible chess player. What I'm saying is I'm fascinated by the game of chess. And in particular, guys, uh, people who who are players of the game who seem to be able to anticipate uh, the moves, like the consequence of you moving your player here, three moves from now, I'm gonna do this, and then I'll win the game. Ah! How do they do that, right? And, and yet, you know, the, the game is maybe analogous to the idea that, that there are consequences. Like, like moving your pawn here is gonna have consequences. Moving your king there or moving your, your, your bishop, it, it, there are consequences. There are going to be ripple down effects and there are some people who can kind of see where all this is going to go and, and how it's gonna be there. It reminds me a little bit of Newton's third law, uh, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Now he was talking about science, he was talking about force. Uh, To every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. But I think there's a theological equivalent to that uh, as well, which is this idea that what we do matters. when, when, even if it's unnoticed, and we've been seeing this in some of the character observations about Saul and then David, what you do matters. There's a ripple effect that's gonna flow out of the choices that you're making today and tomorrow, and and there may be consequences to the decisions that you made yesterday that are going to be unavoidable, because what you do matters. And yet God is at work in the midst of the complexity of our lives. He's he's advancing his purposes. So we come to the the account this morning, and and, and a couple of the preachers this summer, you know, I'm not, this is not me complaining, but they've been complaining about how many chapters I gave them. I got five chapters to cover this morning, (laughs) so suck it up. Um, But but, but really, we're just gonna try to get to the heart of of, of what what the author has for us here. But to, to do that, let me just back up a little bit. We get to 2 Samuel chapter five, and finally, David is king. In fact, by the end of chapter one, he's kind of king. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, but this all began back when the people said to Samuel, we want a king like the nations around us. And, and so they got kind of what they were asked for. Saul was tall, strong, family of good pedigree, reasonable pedigree-ish, kind of, depending on how you read the narrative. And... And it was a disaster. We've been reviewing the, the, the weaknesses. Now, that's not to say there weren't some strengths there. That was one of the surprises for me, I think. You know, I think in the Sunday school narrative, Saul's just always the screw up. You know, and then similarly, David is always like this, you know, he seems to always get it right. You know, we don't tell a couple of the stories because they're, you know, PG-13 or more graphic. Um, but I think that's one of the surprises that we've been grappling with is, is the fact that none of these characters are pristine. Most of them are more negative than they are positive when you really look at what the, what, what, what the, what the narrator is telling us about them, but God. But God, like, but God is at work in the midst of the complexity and, and he's accomplishing his purposes and he's moving forward toward the, the things that he's going to achieve and sometimes he's having to work through incredible crap. Like it is extraordinary how messed up the situation becomes because somebody's moved their pawn here and somebody else has moved their bishop there and the rook and all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, the consequences of all of these people because, well, there's not just one player. There's a whole bunch of people that are involved in, in, in 
resulting in really complicated, messed up situations, but God. And, and so we've been talking about the, the, uh, the brokenness of, of these guys, um, and yet, there is something that is commendable in David. The scriptures talk about that for us. And so we acknowledge the brokenness, but we've got, we, we would make a huge mistake if we didn't come back and say, and yet God was, David was responsive to God. Like bottom line, that seems to be the problem. Saul is gonna do things Saul's way, and it's gonna result in all kinds of difficulty. And yet, if we were to read, I'm not gonna read all five chapters for you this morning. In fact, I'm not gonna read very much at all. I'm gonna do a lot of summing up for you. Um, uh, but, but I'd encourage you to go back and read it again, and, and maybe it'll, it'll help, actually, this conversation will help you read it with more insight. Uh, that's really my hope, that, that, that each Sunday when we gather, you'd walk away wanting to read more scripture, and, and you'd be able to do so with more insight, uh, and, and as a result, you, you would be growing in your faith that this morning would be significant in your discipling, that, that, that you are walking more persistently with God and, and in more of his likeness, more of the likeness of Jesus is evident in you because you've been, you've been here this morning. Uh, David, David was just more responsive to God. He makes all kinds of mistakes. I take enormous encouragement from this. I hope you do too. He makes all kinds of mistakes. And, and yet, we, 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 we have these statements of, of, of him wanting him wanting God. We have this broken wanter. I, 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 I want what I ought not want. It's true of every broken, sin fallen human being. I think it's Beth Moore that I first heard say, you know, talk about broken wanters. Oh. We see it evident here, and, and yet there, there's something there that, that David will respond to. I'll read a passage in a moment. He's the youngest in his family. Um, he's not even invited to dinner when Samuel, uh, the prophet, comes to dine with his family. Um, he seems to be forgettable, inconsequential, at least in, in the context of his family. And, and Saul had been told by God, for Samuel 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him, referring to Saul. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then, and then like, like four verses, five verses later, he's saying, look, go get David. It becomes evident. He goes through the different you know, sons of, and none of them are the ones, sons of Jesse. Well, is that it? Oh, well, there's David. Okay, well, bring David in. The Lord says he's the one. But, but listen to the text itself, 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. Jesse sent for David. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. Did what, like four, five verses earlier, we were told don't look at appearances. God doesn't look at the situation the way we do. And then it tells us he's dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. Um, and the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. And, and so it's apparently, apparently, despite the fact that he's some form of good looking, uh, he's, at least by his family, he's e easily overlooked. David is appointed by God, which, which becomes part of the narrative, and initially, uh, initially, not very many people know about it. It's the family that, that knows about it. Um, uh, Kevin talked about it last Sunday. D David served Saul, and then he had to run from Saul. Um, and, and he made some mistakes, not the least of which was him uh, lying to the priest. Uh, uh, in, did I write it down? What was the priest's name? Ah Ahin Ahinamak? Ahimelech. Ahimelech, thank you very much. There we go. Uh, lying to him about it, the reason for the, the, him getting away, and, and, and the result seems to be that Ahimelech and like 85 priests are, are, are murdered. It's like, man, this is a messy, complicated story that, that we're engaging in here. Uh, uh, Saul had been told the bottom line, God had rejected him. He was not gonna be king. First Samuel 13. Now your kingdom must end for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Ouch. And then in the New Testament, Acts chapter 13, Luke tells us that God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And we come back to this. Uh, 
it's like this question that, that, that is there time and again for us. Will you do? Will you do what God is asking you to do? Like whether you understand it or not, whether it's, will you just follow him responsively? And so we get this part in the narrative, narrative where David becomes king, sort of, and surely, this is me bringing my expectation, surely this is the point where, the, where things get simpler, right? This surely, David is king. He was supposed to be king. Saul wasn't, you know, so now things ought to be working out. Oughtn't this be the time when we would say, ah, things are gonna get easy now. <laughs> if only, right? Right? Uh, isn't this where we would encounter some ease, uh, some relief, but a lot of chess pieces have been moved on the board. A lot of ripple effects have taken place. And it, it, is, it is just not that simple under the sun. It's just not that simple this side of eternity. And we come back then to the question in the middle of all these consequences and all these complications and all of these conflictions to say, well, well who will do what God is asking them? Anyone? Walking with God as the people of God is going to require that we walk differently. Kind of an, an, another sort of major statement we could make as we're going through this narrative. If you're gonna walk as the people of God, you're gonna have to walk differently. And this is true of the leaders. If you've downloaded the, the sermon notes or what, we're finally into my you know, point number one. Um, it's true of the leaders. God's leaders are going to be chosen differently, which becomes a big part of the narrative. As we have been, been like we go way back to where, where the people said, we want a leader like the, uh, the nations around us. Um, we, we have to recognize, well, there were certain norms, even in, in 1100 BC, which is roughly the period of history that we're talking about, about 1100 years before Jesus, there were certain norms. And, and some of those norms were, were things like, kings typically came to their throne through force, through violence. And, and, and then kings, monarchs, typically maintained their, their role in giving leadership uh, through some combination of, of force and power, uh, cunning and craftiness, skill, keen insight, and yet, history would tell us, some of the best didn't survive. But those who, who wanted to survive, one of their hopes would be that their, their son would, would someday become king the beginnings of a dynasty, you know, and then my grandson, and then my great-grandson would become king. This would be the ambition that would be, that, that would be present. But here we have the nation of Israel, and, and, it's, and leaders are gonna be chosen differently. Uh, it's gonna function differently in the family of God. And, and, and Saul, God had already declared, no, I'm sorry, he, he was not responsive to God, and, and and God had declared that that would be the end of his reign. And that's, like he's not listening to God, he's got the prophet Samuel speaking the word of God, he's got the prophet Moses, who by this point, at least portions of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers have been gathered, the Pentateuch, for, for him to be responsive to, for him to receive instruction from, and, and yet he's, he's just doing things his own way. One of the places that David in particular excels is in this Resolve that he will wait for God. His resolve that he will not step into the place of power and authority by his own might. Now, most of the time in the narrative, that's true. I'm not sure it's always true. But when he's on the run, he has two very clear opportunities where he could have taken Saul's life and chooses not to. In fact, the soldiers around him were, were, were imploring him, do it now! Seize the day, carpe diem. This is the opportunity. God's obviously brought the opportunity. He's like, I will not lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. That is not how the leader of this nation is going to be crowned king. And so he waited. Several people actually tried to crown David as king. And we even see that in, in 2 Samuel 1 to, 1 to 5. We, we get to the first chapter of 2 Samuel, and, and there's this unnamed Malachite soldier, is he? We're not sure, who comes and brings Saul's crown and armband and, and, and is looking for some attaboys uh, because it, it kind of seems like he crowned 
he should, he's, he's, he wants David to be king. This is the opportunity. Here you go. Uh, it's been mentioned already, but 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel really read together. Um, uh, 1 Samuel is roughly 25 feet of scroll. 2 Samuel, roughly the same. That's about as long as a scroll would be in those days. Uh, so they, they belong together. So as readers, when you go from the end of 1 Samuel, where it describes to us how Saul and his sons died in the battle on Mount Goboah, um, uh, we then go to the second, and, and this guy comes along, and his narrative doesn't match up. Now, now some would say, well, there you go. The Bible's just inconsistent. No, no, no. Read it the way the author intends us to read it. The guy was lying. Uh, this guy comes with a story of what took place and he's hoping that through his lie and through his deception that he is going to be rewarded because isn't the leader established the way the world establishes a leader? Old guy's gone. Carpe diem, seize the day, jump in. David will have none of it. Orders the guy to be executed for his lie. Second Samuel chapter one. Chapter two, da David consulted the Lord. Well, Lord, what am I supposed to do now? Saul and his family are dead. Um, should I move back to Judah? The Lord said yes. We don't know the details of exactly how that conversation went and exactly how he discerned the, the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of God. I really wish we did. You know, but then we'd probably turn that into some kind of formula and, and we would really mess it all up. In fact, the Lord told him, yeah, I want you to move to Hebron, and, and so he does. Uh, and there he is established and the, and the people, they come and they want to crown him king uh, he becomes king of Judah it's not really clear so is, has God actually finally initiated this or, or you know, is this the people again exercising their will but it is what it is but it's not the fulfillment of the promise of God right? It's, he is king of Judah 2 Samuel 2 not all of Israel in fact, almost simultaneously uh, when David is being crowned by the people of Judah, um, Abner, who was the uh, kind of the foremost general in Saul's army, has taken one of Saul's remaining sons. I'm not sure if there's only two remaining at this point, but he takes Ishbosheth, and he crowns him king because we want a king like the other nations around us, which that would involve a dynasty, wouldn't it? Uh, Abner, you seem to have forgotten that God said, no, he's rejected Saul, but be that as, as it may. And there too, it's not really clear. Uh, is he, like, does he think this is the righteous thing to do? And so he's installing Ishbosheth in honor of Saul, or is it actually a power play on his part uh, as he uh, it becomes the one who seems to be the kingmaker? Uh, he takes Ishbosheth. He, you know, helps set him up. And then when Ishbosheth accuses him of actually wanting the crown, you slept with the. Anyway, you have to read the story. Uh, it becomes evident that actually, I think Abner's just looking for a puppet king here. Um, and, and he really wants to be in charge. This is messy, this is complicated. Like, isn't, like David is finally, you know, moving toward the place that he's supposed to be. Saul's out of the way. Isn't this supposed to start getting simpler? Isn't this the time when we can say, okay, God's will is being affected and now we can move forward? Apparently that's not how it's gonna be. Walking with God as the people of God is, is gonna require that we walk differently. David has been modeling that for us. It's not gonna be through entitlement. You know, dad was king, so I get to be king too. Uh, God's leader is not gonna be established in that way. Nor is God's leader gonna be established by military might because what we end up with in this period of, of, of history and in this portion of scripture is a civil war in Israel. The house of David battling against the house of Saul, and we say, oh, good Lord, how can this be? Uh, in fact, it becomes extraordinarily personal. It's ridiculously bloody, um, and, and, and you're like, how can, this possibly, how can this possibly be? People that know one another uh, end up doing battle to, together. Um, Abner was lead general. Joab was an up-and-coming lead general. Um, Joab had two younger brothers, Abishai, particularly fleet of foot, chases Abner down, and Abner tries calling him off. Look, go after somebody else. Don't do this. And, and finally kills the younger guy. Well, older brother Joab's pretty ticked, of course, which leads to 
chess pieces moving, more ripple effects, more negative consequences, more bloodshed, and it's, it's, it's hard to read. It's hard to read when you, when you think of the personal consequence that is going on in the middle of the story. Finally, we get to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Well, I, I, did want to say, I wanted to add this. It, it, it seems like a lot of the people involved in the story figure God needs a hand up. Like, like, like we just need to kind of help his purpose. He's taking too long, so we need to help his purposes move ahead. And it seems like in much of the narrative, at least David does not do that. He's waiting. He's waiting for God. Here's how, so you, First Chronicles chapter 11, um, most of you will, will, maybe you don't know this. Um, first and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, much of that story is recounted by the chronicler in First and Second Chronicles. So you get, in many cases, some cases, you get two versions of the story. It's really quite fascinating. It brings more insight. Here's how the chronicler in First Chronicles chapter 11 describes when King, David finally is crowned king. Then all Israel gathered before David at Hebron and told him, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even when Saul was king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord your God told you, you will be the shepherd of my people in Israel. You will be the leader of my people, Israel. So here at Hebron, David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel, and they anointed him king of Israel, just as the Lord had promised through Samuel. That's how David became king. It, it was not according to the methods of the world. He did not play a perfect uh, partnership role with God in it, and yet God's purposes move forward through complexity. But it, it also underscores, and we've made reference to this a couple of times, this is not just about the leaders, it's also about the people. How are leaders made leaders? How do the people follow? How, how are, are we supposed to follow the, the, the purposes of God. There's, there's some complicity involved in all of this. It wasn't just about uh, Saul and David and Abner and Saul's son. The people of God need to learn to think differently. We need to learn to think differently as the people of God. Walking with God as the people of God requires that we walk differently. It requires that we think differently. Again, kind of jumping back in the historical narrative, when there were the tribes of Israel, the ambition was that they would be listening to the voice of God and they would be following it, and yet they, they so rarely did so. The people persistently drifted toward being like the people that they had displaced, like the people that, that still were around them, becoming complicit in their, their forms of worship, which God just had not sanctioned. Well, now we got a king. Maybe, the, maybe it's gonna be different now. Well, not so much. Not so much. These same propensities, the same uh, tendency to, to not follow God, to not do what he wants, persists. It persists uh, among the leadership, and it persists among the people. They, they abandon the worship practices, and then we, we, we went through this last summer, Joshua and then Judges. By the time you get to the end of the book of Judges, it's such a, oh my goodness, it is such a horrid, horrid thing. They, the, the, the people of Israel are looking and behaving like, like the Canaanites that were there before them, like the people that, that God had already been bringing judgment on. you like, okay, all right, God's gonna bring judgment here. Is it any better now that we have a king, now that the 12 tribes are united under David? Now that the, the, is, is it going to be any better? And the answer is, well, yes and no. <laughs> um, the request for the king was this rejecting of God and yet God seems to be able to deal with the complexity of that and says okay we'll work with plan B but then plan B is rejected because God's anointed person the person he, he they, they want someone that they have more envisioned and, and then that becomes a, a problem but God's willing to work with the, with the complexity he, he, and so he works through that and Saul becomes a stepping stone to David a man after God's own heart, a man who will do what God wants um, some of the time, uh, maybe, maybe when it counts most, um, but he's still gonna be a very conflicted person and yet God is going to continue to work through this because God is advancing his purposes in the midst of extraordinary complexity and it's true uh, of the leaders from whom much is expected. Like the accountability there is, is enormous. 
and it's true of the people. They will suffer the consequence of, of failing to walk obediently with God. And, and then thirdly, it's gonna be true in the world at large. Uh, God is gonna select leaders differently. Um, he's gonna expect people to follow differently. And the work that he's doing in our world is going to, it's going to advance or it's going to be compromised based on whether God's people are following God in God's way. How are God's purposes advanced in his world? And we can draw a couple of examples of this. I mean, here the nation is in civil war. Uh, it really looks bad on the, the people of, uh, of God. Uh, and yet godly people are, are, are gonna be called to walk differently, think differently, and, and then present differently. This is one of the concerns that we read in the text. Uh, back in 2 Samuel chapter one, when David first hears that Saul has died, um, after he deals with the lying guy that, that showed up, he enters into lament. He writes a, a, a lament for Saul and his sons. And one of the things that he says in that lamentation is his concern that the nations, uh, the, the, the Philistines in particular, uh, would, would not celebrate. He was aware that the world was looking on at the people of God and what was taking place. <laughs> Don't celebrate, this is not a defeat. God is at work in this. He speaks toward that in his lamentation. Um, in, in 2 Samuel chapter five, we see another example of where the nations are looking on and they're being influenced and affected by what takes place. David is finally crowned king at Hebron of uh, the entire uh, 12 tribes of Israel. And King Hiram from, um, oh my goodness, from Tyre. Uh, king Hir uh, Hiram, uh, that's just up the coast of the Mediterranean, just south of modern day Beirut. Um, he, he sends congratulations Yay, way to go, David. Congratulations. Um, and, and then he ends up sing, sending timber, um, cedar from Lebanon, uh, for the building of, of his temple. It begins this relationship that, that actually, if you're with us at camp, we're going to talk about it because we're going to talk about Saul, uh, Solomon, rather, um, when, we, uh, when we get to camp on Thursday night. Um, the nations have been watching on and they are paying attention to what's, what's taking place. And, and, and the, the broadest sense of the narrative is like the, the chieftains of, uh, of the tribes had, had failed, Saul, first kings failed, David did not walk with, with utter integrity before God. It's very easy to find the failings that, that are present there. But God did not fail. Through, through this entire narrative, he has continued to move his purposes forward in the middle of the extraordinary complexity, in, in the middle, middle of, of people disappointing him, in the middle of people, yay, walking with him. That's awesome, high five. In the middle of it all, God continues to accomplish his purposes. But this narrative ultimately takes us through the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel. I don't have time to tell you those stories right now. Roughly half the kings of Judah will follow God. The other half will reject him. All the kings of the northern ten tribes of Israel will reject him. And yet God continues to be at work until finally a son of David, an heir to David's throne, will come and he will be the one who will walk obediently. He, he, Jesus is the one. It's one of the wonderful things about our Christmas carols and the celebration of, at, at Christmas. You know, we recount the this, this story, the announcement. You know, the favor of God is among us because God himself has come. And, and as we walk through the Gospels, we, we, we then realize that uh, it, this is God walking among us, doing what we have failed to be able to do. And, and in his grace and in his favor, He's inviting you to walk with him and to find your success with him. He, he offers to, to indwell every follower with his spirit such that we can begin to write some narratives that aren't so utterly despicable and begin to walk differently and demonstrate that actually when God's power is at work in someone as frail as you, in someone as feeble as me, we are, 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 are enabled to 
walk rightly. Maybe it's two steps forward and one step backward, but it's better than most of the Old Testament accounts, which are one step forward and two steps backwards. But God continues to accomplish his purpose in the midst of these complexities. Jesus will will walk differently. Jesus will be the one who will think differently. Jesus is the one who will present to the nations a picture of of God himself and, and invite them to come and follow. And so the question in the middle of of this grand narrative, this narrative that is true there and it's true here and now, is will you trust him? I I don't know what the complexities of your life are right now. Maybe it's career complexities, maybe it's it's the the challenges of, of, of health, finance, relationship. And the question is, will you resolve to walk with him Whatever, whatever the complexity of it is. Will you resolve to trust him? Ultimately, Jesus, what's most important right now is that you and I walk together. Will you do what God asks of you, whether you understand it or not? Like like so much of that is, is, is it's the work in the pages of scripture. I don't understand that. I'm, I'm I'm your pastor, And I gotta tell you, as I read through the pages of scripture, every week I'm like, holy smokes, I don't understand that. And so I go and I consult with some other people, I read some commentaries, I try to get better understanding, and I always do, and usually the complexity of it astounds me. You know, because you know, there's two or three or five PhDs who have studied this in-depthly and they don't actually agree on with one another, at least on some points. And I come back and I say, "Well, well, I trust God in the middle of extraordinary complexities of our world. It's a principle that touches every area of our lives. We're gonna talk about it more this fall. We're gonna do a series that we're calling Grounded. And it's it's gonna call us back to this idea that that will we trust God with that which doesn't make sense? We refer to that as faith. We walk by faith and not by sight doesn't mean we try to know and understand more. It it means we choose to trust and walk in the midst of that which we we, we don't fully understand. Will we walk by faith and not by sight in in the midst of of chess pieces that have moved and ripple effects that are are, are ongoing and and complexities? Uh, Yeah, I'm following Jesus and man, it's difficult. Will you keep following him? We have this unfortunate idea as human beings that um, I will only follow and be obedient to that which I can understand. Uh, And and in that resolve, I place myself above God. If he were God, he would. I don't understand this, that doesn't make sense, therefore it can't. And and in that, we we sin. And so we come back, and the posture of, of David at his best would be, will I wait? Will I trust? Will I walk even when it's extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult and hold his hand? Um, marriage doesn't come up in this, and yet it kind of does. This, 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 this entire narrative has been so much about uh, people trying to, to walk together. Um, uh, since the early days, uh, the, the 12 sons of Jacob who became Israel, uh, the, the 12 sons who became the 12 tribes, they've had difficulty getting along. Uh, you may recall a, a guy named Joseph, coat of many colors. Oh my goodness, talk about difficulties getting along, right? And the question is, will we get along? Can we, can we build relationships? And can we persevere in those relationships that, that God wants to do a good thing through even when they're difficult? Well, we've got a couple of newlyweds among us here. Persevere in your relationship. Persevere in your love for one another, even when it gets difficult. Uh, Find ways to allow God to be seen in and through your relationship. Maybe you're nothing like a newlywed, and that same exhortation needs to be yours. Will you persevere in in the, the covenant commitment that you've made to one another? Because God is glorified through the perseverance, He's present in the complexity. And he's asking us, will we just walk faithfully with him with that which we understand, that which we don't understand? Now, uh, 
I think one of the, the, the takeaways, I, I learned this maybe from the Sunday school versions, but I still th- believe that it's true. One of the things that we see in God's persistence in the midst of the complexities is that he will accomplish his will one way or the other. Seems that it's kind of up to me as to whether that'll be the easy way or the hard way. Uh, now, I'm, in that, I'm, I'm not saying that if you are in a really difficult place that it's your fault. I'm not saying that at all. But I know in my own life, there have been times when the granite had to be chipped away uh, because the heart just was not soft enough for God to really do his work. And so we come back and we say, well, will, will we, in the midst of all of this, will we comply? Will we agree? Will we take on the heart of David and, and say, I want to do it your way? The next week, Pastor Tim Brazo is going to walk us through some of the Psalms and, and, and uh, David as a worshiper. Um, beautiful declarations at least moments <laughs> at least moments where he says yes I want to follow I want to I want to follow I want to be there um, will you do what God is asking will you walk differently will you think differently will you present differently to the world help us as a church present differently to the world there's horrific stories of that I realize you know in the media it seems like you know every few years another terrible story comes along where the church has embarrassed herself by trying to hide things by trying it's, it's ridiculous it's, it's grievous um, what about you like will you do what God is asking you to do anyone would anyone say yes yeah, I, I, that, that, that is the, the way I want to orient my heart toward God And in that we recognize that we will fail if we try to do it in our own strength. And we are desperate to need Jesus, that we must be persistent with him and in him find his successes. Desiring that he be seen before me. And it's part of what brings us to the Lord's table this morning because we come back each Sunday and we say I need to be recalling exactly what he's done for me the the, the son of David who has prevailed in the midst of a wretchedly long list of failures and I want to be with him in his in his success he alone he alone can lead me he alone can lead you and unless we're hidden in him and he is seen, well, what we see is, is failure. We're gonna talk about Solomon Thursday through Sunday for those of us who are going to camp together. But we're gonna come this morning to the table again and, and be reminded that yes, this is what we most need is to keep coming back to Jesus himself. Yeah. And, and we're reminded that, that purposing to follow Jesus. So, so would you allow the Lord's table this morning to be just another place of resolution in your life? Purposing to follow Jesus, to feed on Jesus, to, to seek him instead of myself, to seek his, his will, his way, his work instead of my own. Mm-hmm.